Welcome everyone to the home of FIFA. After celebrating Mario Zagallo's 90th birthday, we will now take a look at the start and the favorites of the 11th FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup in Russia at the Luzhniki Beach Soccer Stadium. And we will speak about the new campaign Reach Out with FIFA's Chief Social Responsibility and Education Officer Joyce Cook and with former Bolton Wanderers and Team GB forward Marvin Sodell. So welcome to Living Football Episode 12. Hay veces que no sabemos qué decir. Helfen kann schwierig sein. Voici ce que tu peux dire à un proche qui est en difficulté. ¿Qué te apetecería que hiciéramos juntos? Por una fecha y lo hacemos. ¿Cuál fue la última vez que te prestaste a ti mismo el cariño y la atención que le prestas a los demás? ¿Cómo estás? No, I mean really. ¿Cómo você se siente? Si hay un moyen para te sentir mejor, ¿cuál sería? Open conversations with the people that matter to us are important. Si esa conversa soa como algo que você está precisando, no hesite, estenda a mano. Tiende la mano. Tiende la mano. Reach out. Reach out. Reach out. They all reach out because the numbers are quite shocking. According to WHO statistics, more than 260 million people in the world are suffering from depression. Among active football players, 23% report sleep disturbance, 9% have reported depression, and a further 7% suffer from anxiety. So the numbers of unreported cases are also high. It's an issue that can affect us all. And we are here to talk about it with FIFA's Chief Social Responsibility and Education Officer, Joyce Cook. Hi, Jessica, how are you? I'm fine, thank you very Good. much. And Joyce, it's a pleasure you're joining us. So the figures are quite alarming. So what can you tell us about the background of the FIFA Reach Out campaign? So it, it, it's a campaign we've wanted to do for a while. It's, a, it, it's an area of work which our, our, our medical director is, is focused on uh, with his team. It's an area we understand well. It is a challenge in sport, in football, and of course globally. And, and, and more recently, we stepped into raising awareness around health and well-being and protection against the the COVID-19 virus and the pandemic. And we begin to, began to understand more and more with our partners like the World Health Organization of the other aspects, not least domestic violence. And of course, we did a campaign, the Safe Home campaign to raise awareness on domestic violence and the increase during the pandemic. And, and understand very well that, that that's been a case during, uh, during COVID for mental health. We also understand at FIFA that we have a voice that we can use. We have these incredible uh, legends, FIFA legends, that can help us to raise awareness. And so for us, it's important that we play our part in, in encouraging people to reach out, to speak to one another, and to strip back some of these taboos as well, because it's still a subject that we feel uncomfortable speaking about, and we shouldn't. We're quite happy to discuss our physical ailments, our physical illnesses more and more. Um, we've done a lot of work in football to, to encourage men to reach out in that regard, but we now need to really step this up on a global level in regards to our mental health and well-being. I mean, the name speaks for itself, reach out. So why is it so important to reach out and possibly start a life-saving conversation? Well, a really shocking stat is that the fourth largest cause of suicide among young people between 15 and 29 is, 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 is because of mental health. And I mean, that's, that, that's, that's, that, that shocks anybody that you say that to. We're all going to have mental health issues during our lifetime, that's a given, and, and we should all accept that and that it's quite normal. We live stressful lives. Um, and something as simple as reaching out and having a conversation about how you're feeling about perhaps needing to, to, to get some professional help and knowing it's okay to do so is so incredibly important. Hence the reach out strap line. Um, but most importantly, the, 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 the stories of the courageous uh, players and families of players that have come forward in this campaign to talk about their journey, to talk about what happened to them. And I think if we can bring to life for young people, for people out um, in the game and more broadly, from the mouths of, of professional footballers, you know, famous footballers that say it happened to me, that can only help. 
Uh, you just mentioned it. Well, the campaign here is, for example, from FIFA legends Cafu, uh, Laura George, Luis Garcia, Farah Williams, Walter Zenga, and many more. So, but in many countries, it is still a big taboo. So how can we break down the stigma? Well, I think by speaking about it, by speaking very openly, by using FIFA's voice, we're working in partnership with the ASEAN um, Association as well in, in Asia. So they asked us to help them to resonate this more broadly, to use uh, legends within in the Asia region. And that's been a big part of this campaign, um, taking guidance from the World Health Organization, doing it in partnership with them. And what you'll see over the course of this campaign now, as we head up towards October, um, more and more stories coming forward and and we just want to get everybody speaking about this and and I think the players themselves tell this best of all when they talk about their experiences and it isn't always needing to talk sometimes it's just knowing that you're in the presence of somebody that understands um, the other thing we're doing is to multiply this together with the support of our member associations around the world and to signpost to to, to helplines national helplines so people know where they can get help from you just mentioned the story so was there Anyone's story that touched you in particular? Each of the stories has, has, has touched me and I'm, I'm sure they will resonate. They, they, they all speak of their own different experiences and what it does is bring to life very clearly, we hope, and will resonate and reach people out there who are perhaps at this moment feeling alone, feeling isolated, uh, feeling depressed. Uh, maybe the stress of work, of playing, um, whatever it might be that, that one of those stories will resonate and that, that it will encourage someone to reach out. And, you know, if we can save one life from this campaign, it's been more than worth it. And I hope and I'm sure we will have a bigger reach than that. And that's really our intention to do. So we're not experts in mental health. But having said that, we know very well that we can use our voice to really shine a light on this on this important area. But we will showcase one story in particular now, because in England, they would say, so far, so good. Farah Williams, 172 caps for England, participated in three FIFA Women's World Cups in 2015. She gave England the winning goal in a 1-0 victory over Germany and secured the bronze medal, the team's best ever finish at the FIFA Women's World Cup. An iconic player, but also she struggled a lot with mental health problems during her career. Players cry out for wanting to feel valued and, and be a, a part of something and that's why they get into team sports because they want to be a part of a group or a family. Through good, bad and indifferent, football has been my life, it's been my out, it's been my go-to. So to, to make that decision to retire, when I still feel a little bit able to continue, was obviously difficult. I was leaking protein from the kidney into my body. You know, certainly played a massive part in my decision to, to retire. I was put on a very high dosage of steroids and other medication to try and help me come into remission, which, which, which I am now, which, which I'm you know, very happy about. But, but during that time of being on the medication, um, my weight, it, you know, I must have put on eight or nine kilos in weight. I had the, the typical moon face that you get when you're on steroids. You know, going to training, uh, I found really difficult because of how I looked and what people would have thought of me. And then, and then playing games was was ten times that. If I think about my early career, when I spoke about thinking that showing resilience and mental toughness was what I felt in the early stage really helped me to progress and develop. And it was the same even even with the illness, even in the moments where I knew I wasn't right. Uh, you, you know, my partner, I'd, I'd be at home and I'd, I'd be a, a, a terrible partner to be around. I just couldn't accept it and, I, and, and as I said, I think it was those really early stages where I didn't want to show that vulnerability and you know, I needed in those moments to show weakness and you know, get the help that I needed. It got to a point where I nearly broke the, just before Christmas and you know, six months into the illness I kind of accepted that you know, I was ill and I was mentally really struggling and started to speak to somebody so it took me a while, you know, on reflection I wish I accepted it earlier and dealt with the illness a little bit better. Talking to people and being open about things rather than keeping everything closed certainly allowed me to, to be more in touch with it I guess. Once you do talk to somebody that is the best thing you can do but actually that initial 
you know acceptance or acceptance of needing to talk to somebody is really difficult you know it's important that you know we recognize that you know changes in people and I think they, they become quite obvious you know where we, where we spoke before of asking somebody are they okay it, it can't be a one-off you, you know you have to dig a little bit deeper maybe you know you push those conversations more than they're willing to give until eventually they come out and talk you know I was crying out I guess with my actions when I was ill that you know I, I needed to talk I wanted to talk but just I wanted somebody to initiate that for me. Joyce, isn't that kind of also heartbreaking that the most capped England player ever, including the men, has these mass massive problems and no possibility to reach out? I think it does a number of things. First of all, big thanks to Farah um, for sharing her story and having the courage to do so because that will have a far-reaching impact for many people. And to know that if a famous footballer can feel like this, then, uh, then it is okay and it is normal to, to feel like that too. So I, 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 um, I think a number of things. I think the awareness that we all feel in the game that we have to ensure that there are places now. A lot of teams have a, a psychologist that works with the team and the players. Um, and even at the grassroots level, there's more, more, more um, thought to this, but we still have work to do. And I think for Farah um, to share her story and to have reached out and to, 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 to share with us how that happened and the journey she went on is really important. She's such a brave woman. And we have another participant in the campaign, Marvin Sodell, former Watford Bolton Wanderers and Team GB forward. He played at the Olympics 2012 in London and he also struggled with mental illness issues during his career. We are very grateful that he is part of the campaign and that he agreed to do this interview right now. So welcome Marvin Sodell. Hey Marvin. Hello. Marvin, where are you and how are you right now? Um, I'm in Watford. It's where I live now. So just north of London. And to me, I'm great. I think things are, are really good now, particularly since I've moved on from football. Things are really positive in life. You, you retired two years ago and it's fantastic that you speak out in the Reach Out campaign because it means a lot to young people. So can you tell us a little about your personal history when it comes to mental health and also mental health issues? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I'm someone who's spoken about this a lot and I'm very open with doing so. Throughout my playing career, particularly in my early years, um, in my professional career from like 20-ish, I started to struggle with mental health issues, later on diagnosed with depression, um, you know, um, to a point where I was, you know, really in a bad way and I attempted to take my own life. And since I've been on the road to recovery, I guess, and, and trying to spread awareness around mental health, because I think it's, it's such a thing that people don't often like to acknowledge or, or discuss or, Uh, sometimes ashamed of admitting essentially but this is something that happens and something that a lot of people have to go through so you know for me to talk and to share my story is so important to myself but of course I'm sure to many others as well. Why do you think people still feel ashamed to open up about mental health issues? I mean it's a common disease it's it's uh, it's not something that we are not confronted with every day. Yeah I mean It's, it's a very difficult thing to talk about because it's not, you know, up until, you know, very recently with talking maybe the last year or two in particular, it's not something that people have very much spoken about. Um, definitely not in to this extent in the public eye where there's a lot of campaigns and there's a lot of people who are in the public eye speaking about their own issues. So it can be a very difficult thing purely as well because of the fact that it's not something that you can show people. It's not something that you can physically see on somebody else. It is a purely internal thing that can be difficult to describe at times as well because there are so many emotions and so many things going on in your mind that you can't quite put to words. And if you're trying to explain to someone how you feel and you don't necessarily know how to how to quantify it yourself, then it, it can be really difficult to talk about, even just on a very practical level. I mean, you have with courage shared your story and you discuss, as you did before, the moment you tried to take your own life. How did things change from there? And was it possible yeah. to ask for help in your environment? I found it very difficult, to be honest, to ask for help. Um, 
and I think that's one of the reasons why I do what I do because I know that football as an industry is it's it can be or or historically it has been deemed as a weakness you know um we, we talk about being tough and physically and, and mentally and and I think we confuse being mentally tough with kind of suppressing our emotional feelings and and you know to to an extent depression and that was something that I struggled with and it took me a, a, a long time to really be able to talk about it but I finally and eventually got to a point where I was comfortable enough to to share how I felt with my closest friends and family and, and as a, in a way it was a way of getting things off my chest it wasn't necessarily just a conversation and as I say to many people you communication is not just something that we we only do verbally you know as human beings we communicate through so many different mediums so for me mine was writing it down as as poetry and sharing that with my friends and family and and they got to understand firsthand what was going on inside my mind they understood my emotions because I wrote my emotions down and we don't necessarily have to only speak or write you know we can send texts or emails or or body language sometimes is enough when you're around people so communication is so very important when we're when we're discussing wanting to share our our emotions and our, our thoughts and feelings. Marvin, I would like to ask one question to Joyce. Um, if anyone watching this is concerned about someone close to them, how can they help? I, I think, first of all, Marvin, I don't know which way to look. Well, you can see me. <laughs> I can see you looking behind, but I think I need to look this way. But a massive thank you to you for, for sharing your story and your journey. You know, this is going to be so powerful for so many people and we want to really get everybody speaking about this around the world. So big, big thank you for that. Um, you, you, you've, you've really encapsulated that the most important and the core of this campaign, which is it's okay to talk about our feelings. You know, we may well ask someone if they've got a headache, did they eat something that gave them that or whatever it might be. And we have to normalize, we have to all know it's perfectly okay. In fact, it's more than okay to ask each other how we feel. And as you say, to just be around and supportive and, and, and there, and sometimes it isn't about extensive discussions, but opening up about our feelings in whichever way that may take shape or form and through you it's through your poetry so you know I, I honestly from fifa we cannot thank you enough marvin you and all of the other players that have been prepared to speak out so a huge thank you to you marvin one thank thing you. i'm i'm very interested in so what changed when you started to to open up and to share your story and also to share your feelings because i think I mean, people, there have been people reacting also in a good way. Yeah, I mean, I think that the first thing that I realized was that I wasn't alone. And, you know, that's a very common trait for people who are struggling with their mental health is that they think they're in it alone. They think they're the only person probably in the world that is feeling that way. But, you know, you quickly realize, and I very quickly realized that, A, I wasn't alone in, in having to face this, but also I wasn't the only person that was suffering from this type of thing, you know, so me speaking about it, it made it a lot easier to, to confront it because I knew that I wasn't the first person doing it. I wasn't going to be the last person. I wasn't the only person. And I didn't have to walk this path on my own. You know, I, I had amazing people around me and very supportive people that could, that could help me as well. So now you're just 30 years old with many talents of the field. What are you currently enjoying working on? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of different things. And when people ask me, I just, yeah, <laughs> people ask me like what, what my title is. And I, I say I'm like a character from Game of Thrones. I have just a, a loads of different titles, but my, um, you know, my main passion is storytelling. So that, that comes through so many different mediums for me and, and whether that's writing poetry or writing script or through documentary filmmaking um, through my production company or, or other ways, storytelling is definitely my, my, my main love in life. Marvin, so thank you very much for telling us your story. And thanks for participating in the FIFA campaign. It was a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, thank Marvin. You Marvin. Thank you. So 
Joyce, a last question. Um, how would you like to see football use its power in fighting this fight against mental health issues? We have this unique opportunity as FIFA, as football, as legends and, and, and more to, to really raise a voice that will resonate with youth, uh, with the wider society. So we understand that. It's something we are stepping into embracing more and more in, in, in all of these social issues. You know, I think it's worth just briefly reflecting the pandemic. We're not really clear yet just what impact the pandemic is going to have for the long term. So. Um, we see this as the start of a, a journey in, in improving mental health well-being and taking care of mental health, be it through our preventative programmes such as the FIFA Guardians programme to make sure that children and vulnerable adults are, are, and their well-being are front and centre stage and the most important priority, that there are people around, that, that professionals, that, that players, that anybody can speak to, um, and that we just get everybody speaking about their mental health and well-being because that's okay. It is. Thank you very much, Joyce Cook. Please come here more often. I'd love to come back. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. More information on the campaign you can find on FIFA.com. There you will also find a video about the school tournament in Benin, which was jointly organized by FIFA, the Benin Football Association and the Benin Ministry of Sport. 12 boys and girls under 16 teams competed in this week-long event and it wasn't only players having the chance to show their skills. Young referees and reporters also underwent training sessions before putting their abilities into practice once the action got underway. It's important for, uh, for the CAF to support this uh, initiative because, first of all, it doesn't happen on its own territory and, secondly, it has an interest, an interest continental. We uh, have to salute this initiative that the President Infantino and the le, le, le President of the Republic of Bernard, His Excellency Patrice Terrelon, have wanted to put in place. It's not just uh, uh, important for the Bernard. This is a model that we will duplicate in all of Africa. It was a successful event showcasing the link between football, education and society. So from West Africa, we make a leap to a member association around 7,000 kilometers away. In 2017, two massive hurricanes hit Puerto Rico, causing billions of dollars in damage. According to a Harvard study, over 3,000 people lost their lives in the course of this natural disaster. In the following film, we show you how the grants from the FIFA Forward program helped to bring football back to life in Puerto Rico. La tormenta hizo bastantes estragos en nuestro fútbol, ya que afectó en nuestra infraestructura grandemente, en la seguridad de las canchas para los jugadores. Eh, las canchas estaban llenas de escombros, no tenían iluminación, o sea que no era un ambiente seguro para nuestros jugadores poder desenvolverse dentro de ellas. Así es que el fútbol tuvo un gran golpe con estas tormentas y tuvimos una larga recuperación. Un monstruo que entró en nuestra islita y se la tragó literalmente. Estuvimos sin luz, sin agua. Fue algo que nunca pensaba vivir. La oficina regional de la FIFA, que tiene sede en Panamá, pues vino eh, cerquita de pasado dos semanas de haber ocurrido el, los eventos de los huracanes. Y entonces hicieron una inspección ocular con la Federación Puertorriqueña de Fútbol recorriendo toda la, la isla, ¿verdad? Una ayuda excelente, ya que una cantidad de dinero importante para, para nuestra federación y también fue dirigida a, a lo que eran unas prioridades como en un caso fue una partida dirigida a lo que era nuestro estadio y luego también hubo unas partidas dirigidas a nuestros clubes y, y fue, fue una cercanía importante que hizo, que hizo FIFA para, para darnos la mano en un momento muy complicado del, como país. Yo digo que el FIFA es la palabra más importante después de fútbol. Este, entonces para nosotros ha sido importante porque se ve digamos, la seriedad que, que tiene esto, la seriedad que tiene FIFA, el compromiso que tiene FIFA con, con, con diferentes países que están en, en desarrollo y con, con nosotros en particular ha, ha sido de mucha ayuda y, y, y mucha, mucho agradecimiento de nosotros para la Fundación. Yo en los años que llevo como parte del fútbol en Puerto Rico nunca había recibido tanta ayuda de una federación, nunca. 
Este programa nos ayudó grandemente, dado a que el arreglo, la remoción de escombros y todo conlleva unos costos, inclusive la iluminación de los campos, que fue de las más afectadas. Y estos fondos nos ayudaron mucho a reponer esta, estos estragos, esta iluminación, estas estructuras. FIFA Forward literalmente se convirtió en nuestra fuente principal para poder operar. So que sí son vitales en, en lo que viene siendo el progreso actual de la federación y los, que, y los próximos años. And as football is coming back to life, we are again looking forward to the upcoming FIFA events like the FIFA Futsal World Cup in September in Lithuania and of course the FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup in Russia, which just started at the Luzhniki Beach Soccer Stadium. Of beach soccer. The FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup takes place every two years. 16 nations compete on this international stage. So far there have been four title holders, namely Brazil, Portugal, Russia and France. Russia 2021 is the 11th edition of the FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup. Before the tournament, we had the chance to speak to two-time FIFA Beach Soccer World Champion, the Portuguese icon, Matcha. Everybody's looking forward because it's the, the greatest event that can happen. I had the pleasure to play for 22 years this, this sport. I think it's will, it will be the, the most difficult uh, World Cup ever. Uh, but we have Brazil, we have Russia playing at home also. Uh, we have uh, Paraguay, Tahiti, Spain. So uh, it's going to be tough, but to be a world champion, we have to beat all the teams that show up. The World Cup that uh, I won in, in Portugal in 2015, it was great because we were playing with our own crowds uh, and it was an amazing feeling. I finished as a world champion, it was, it was something fantastic. Some of them that they can do great on the beach. Uh, we have Cristiano Ronaldo, we have Messi, uh, we have uh, Luis Suarez, we have Neymar. If they want to try, they can join us, that arms open to, to get them. <laughs> Now I'm working with the Federation, I'm the beach soccer coordinator uh, on the, the Portuguese FA. We are bringing some other kids, more competitions, women to, to play. I'm glad that I'm doing that and that I keep being with the family of beach soccer. The FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup in Russia, the entire tournament will take place from today to August 29 at the Luzhniki Olympic Complex. Updates on FIFA.com. This is it for episode 12. Next time you will meet FIFA's chief women's football officer, the amazing Sarai Barman. Till then, take care and have fun with the FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup. Goodbye.